everybody. Welcome to Between the Sheets here on United Broadcasting Network. Um, hope all your isolation and whatever the hell else we're doing, hibernation is going well, <clears throat> wherever the hell in the world you are. Um, this is the third Friday of every month, and we're on the first and third Friday of every month at 7 p.m. Pacific here on United Broadcasting Network. We have a wonderful show tonight. Um, as you know, we are Zooming it. We will Zoom it until this isolation's over. We do want you to participate, so please do call in. Yes, we have call-ins, 323-524-2599, and the number will be scrolling somewhere on the screen at some point, but it's 323-524-2599. Um, welcome to the new normal. I just want to welcome my ladies back. Um, we have Cheryl Murphy in the house. Hey, Gay. How are you doing? Good to be Good. here. Good. Yay. It has been. We have Delicia. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. How are you? How are I'm you holding awesome. up in Santa I, Paula? I'm okay, to be honest. <clears throat> okay. Um, we've got Mara Shane. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Hey, Mara, your name says Mara Shabo. What the hell is that? <laughs> That's my real last name. It's Mara Zabo. Shane's my middle name, but you guys can get me as Mara Zabo this time because that's what I put in on my Zoom account. Okay, Ooh. just check it. I didn't know you had an alias. Um, and then, and then we have the beautiful, lovely, who just cut her hair. Kim Sanchez is in the house. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Yay! This is done. If you want me to cut your hair, I'm. I'll go for it. Just saying. <clears throat> hey, why are you on twice? Who? You. There's two Kim Samberly Sanchez. Oh, never mind. That's a to that's that's the station thing. Um, I I know what he's doing. Hey, Kurt. <laughs> Kurt's there, man in the keys, and I. Where's yeah. I'm still technologically stupid right now. And then of course, all the way from England mm -hmm. via California and eating food as she always <laughs> is is Car and if she's not eating food, she's drinking wine. Is lovely Cara Noble. Is this something in my jeans? Yes, I am. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, so we have, so today's show, I mean, besides that, we're going to be funny. Um, and we, only us can make this serious topic funny. And the topic today is on addiction. Um, so, you know, I pulled out um, Rachel Simpson all the way from Florida. She is the owner operator at Dynamic Wellness Solutions, a certified addiction interventionist. Certified dual diagnosis therapist. I have no fucking idea what that means. But in any way, you're qualified at doing what you're doing. Um, welcome. Let's everybody welcome Rachel Simpson in the house. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. Happy I'm to so be here. I'm so happy you're here. And then, well, of course, you know, I pull up this woman's bio and it's 17 pages long. It's, um, she's a Latinx. I like to use that word Latinx. Would that be appropriate, Sandra, to use Latinx? Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Latinx. I just like to say it. It's um, com comedian, comedian, actor, singer, and downright badass from Texas. And we all know her because she's one of our kind, um, except for Cheryl's kind and Cara's kind. But she's the rest of us. She's our kind. Um, it means she's a lesbian. Um, it's the wonderful <laughs> fucking funny. She had a show off Broadway. We'll talk about it. But it's Sandra Valls. I'm so happy. But I wanted to tell you all a little bit of information about Sandra Valls. No, I did not sleep with her. Um, but in my second, I know in my second incarnation of Between the Sheets podcast, um, I met her a long time ago through what Sharon Glass Berlin, something like that. But yeah. in my second incarnation, before she blew up, um, she humbly joined the panel at Between the Sheets as a rotating co-host. So I want to say welcome Very home, cool. Sandra. Welcome Very home. Cool. That was so much fun. Yay. Yay. And she used yeah. to dress really butch and have a hat on and a tie. Very guapita. <laughs> Very guapa. I got to I say. used to. I used, used to. to. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just t-shirt and tennis, yeah. you know? Them now. You know, you get older, <laughs> you get comfortable. So... Hey, trust me, we're all, I'm, I have no pants. Uh, I'm doing this in no I pants. I don't have right? any That's pants either. <laughs> <laughs> no pants. No pants. I'm waiting for somebody don't to say me. that. You know I don't wear pants. Don't <laughs> <tend> <laughs> me. Uh. So 
I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I always want to do a check-in really quick and see what everybody's been up to before we start moving forward and letting the crazy train leave the station. So I'll start with Cheryl. Cheryl, what have you been up to? I've been doing so many online Zoom meetings and you know, uh, giveaways, fundraisers, trying to help out all the healthcare workers, actually trying to support everyone. But I am, I have been on Zoom for like three days straight now, nonstop, day and night. I can't tell you. It's been so much. It's so popular. So welcome to our world. Yeah. Delicia, what have you been up to? Whoa, you said my name right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of gardening. I actually got some coconut trees from Hawaii and I planted those and a macadamia nut tree and I got my whole garden ready. I'm ready for the apocalypse. So <laughs> I, I will have veggies at least. Do you have an avocado tree? I do. And a lemon and like two different kinds of lemons, three different kinds of oranges, pomegranates, like lime tree, capra lime tree, whatever you need. I got it, man. I'm coming up with my mask and my gloves when they're ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Mara Shane, what have you been up to? My, my beautiful, inspirational, creative artist. Thank you. Um, I have been working on a really cool project for Delisha. Um, it's a painting that she commissioned for me from me and it's huge. It's very, very large on my wall and I've been working on that. Um, I've been trying to work out in my tiny little studio by doing like aerobic dance videos, but it hasn't gone very well. Um, uh, sorry, my cat, my little kitty. Um, <laughs> that's it really, just painting, painting, working, Aww. and that's it. Yeah, isn't, isn't he cute? Aww. He is cute. Beautiful. He's adorable little cat, actually. Cat cute. So, it is cat cute. Um, Kara, what have you been up to? Well, I uh, just, I don't want to boast, but I grew my own avocado tree. I'll just have you know that. <laughs> I, I, did. I grew it from seed. It's about this tall now. Nice. Um, but I also like Delisha. I've been planting <laughs> food this week, just in case. Squash, <laughs> good cucumbers, idea. peppers. So I've got a little, <laughs> little garden going. And I'm working there. on my Taj Mahal uh, mosaic, and I've now started on the sunny side. Ah. So I'm just doing sunrise at the moment, so that's mm. exciting. Mm. And also do dancing every day. I do either a salsa class or a yoga class virtually every day online. Fantastic. Well, very cool. And Kimberly. Kimberly is out there, you know, just working. So what is, what's it been like? What have you been up to, sweetheart? Well, I have to tell you, coming home today, and okay, so can I ask something? What does it mean when the computer is saying my network bandwidth is low? Yeah. It, that it means that, you, you freeze. You'll, free, you'll freeze every once in a while. Um, so is that bad? I mean, is that happening right now? I can't tell. No, you look no, gorgeous. You're, no, no, you're good. You're good. You're gorgeous. <laughs> okay. So anyway, yeah, I'm just working today. I actually came. Oh, there it went. Now you froze. Yeah, I don't know now out. that hasn't been out lately, but there are a lot of people out today. That's not good. Exactly. I know. I, I went out to go get some groceries and it was like, again, just a regular day. And I don't understand. And it pisses me off. Mm. This stupid woman on mm. my street, she was walking around with her baby carriage and I mean, there was, I mean, I'm sure there's no baby masks, but she was just going down the street with the baby and no mask. And I'm like, and I literally wanted to just jump up there and say, what the fuck are you doing? You ignorant bitch. But you know, I didn't, I didn't want to bar brawl. I really did. I had one of those already. I don't want to repeat that. Um, just only one, only one, only one. It took me 55 years to have my first bar brawl. That's not so bad. Um, Sandra, what have you been doing? Uh, eating. <laughs> yes. Snacks. All oh, those I snacks. I mean, snacks. Take that. Um, a lot, actually. It, it every. I think everyone mm -hmm. can 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 relate to. There's so much time, but then you kind of don't have time. You're like, where did it go? Kind of trying to balance it out. Um, I have been getting back to my Buddhist practice. So I chant, mm -hmm. so I've been doing that uh, with a group every day, chanting for the vibration of the planet. Um, I've been walking. I've been exercising. Uh, I'm here in Austin. I was doing a play here called Roe, uh, as in Roe versus Wade. I played uh, Roe's girlfriend, who knew she was a lesbian. 
I'm sorry. What? I don't. I didn't. Was I she didn't know really a lesbian? Rose Bates. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Anyway, the no? play, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about the Roe v. Wade that I didn't know, but it was canceled. Oh. So I was stuck in Austin with my sister. Um, every Saturday, we do uh, a really fun playroom karaoke where we wear these weird Viking ma uh, hats and we just do throwback from the 70s and 80s and 90s and whatever. And because I also sing and we, my sister and I harmonize and we plan that like all week, what songs are we going to sing? And that's a Saturday at seven central. And then, Gay um, and then Gayan types in, play this song, sing this song, sing this song. Then I'm all right. And then suddenly, black <laughs> summer. <laughs> and then suddenly, I was like, I got that last summer. That's um, a, that you have a good voice. She's yeah. a singer. Yes, she does. <laughs> uh, and Sandra, so, Monday. Hey, Sandra, did, you were chanting for a vibrator. Did you get it? <laughs> we have to, yes it's actually it's a continuation of keeping your vibration up daily uh minute by minute actually it's we chant namyo horenge kyo if anybody wants to join us at 4 30 central yeah uh, for an hour i don't uh, think that's so important, important i gotta say care? because uh can i just say i truly chanted for a vibration and a vibrator came in the mail <laughs> that's, that's, that's what i thought you meant <laughs> well, oh Oh, oh, is that? I didn't hear you. You said that the vibration come. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I, got, I got carpal tunnel going on here. So uh, it's uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. But uh, I have a client that I print for Crave and I told her when this first happened, man, you guys are going to be busy. And she was like, I don't know about that. Then did you see the SNL skit they did about breaking the vibrators all the time? No, no but I think I, I'm very grateful for a shower massage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we all are i take As very we all long are. showers so do i Ra and rachel what have you been up to you're in florida correct i am in florida and uh i think my mom's watching so hi mom if you're out there and um so i've been very fortunate that for me my business doesn't stop mm -hmm. because you know addiction mm -hmm. doesn't just you know close its door and shut down because of the pandemic. So I am in one particular hospital as the, um, the nursing supervisor from a, for a detox and um, another company that I work for that we can talk about maybe a little bit later, which is unbelievable is in-home services. It's a company that partnered with Blue Cross Blue Shield because they were so impressed with the model. And so the clients get 52 weeks of services. So there I'm the clinical director in the sense that I manage the teams and I make sure that all the patients are seen. Normally we would do it in their homes, but now we're doing it all virtual. So I've learned a lot about Zoom and, you know, so I'm doing that. So I'm very blessed in the sense that, um, you know, I can still work during these times and that the second one, since it's home, at least I get to spend, you know, a lot of time with my son that normally I wouldn't get to. And uh, but it's a rough time for addiction right now. Well, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I would think that people that are like isolated at home and stuff like that, that their addictions and their self-medicating would come out even more now. Yeah. I just I would... lost three people in the span of a week that I've worked oh. with or were one of my clients. So oh, it's no. been bad. I'm sorry. A lot of relapses. I'm sorry. That's yeah. a tough sorry. time right now. Yeah, um, this is probably the worst thing that could happen for people in recovery, especially early recovery. Yeah, uh, you know when there's not a lot of people around to hold them accountable, and you know they're kind of on the fence about meetings or recovery resources or any kind of support. And if they're home alone, you know that's that's it. They're isolating. They're probably saying, "Oh, you know, I'll just drink right now and get myself through this day, or I'll just use then," but that never is, you know, the appropriate solution ever. And it's, it's much worse now because they're not going to meetings, <clears throat> their meetings online. It's just not the same. And, you know, I know that's the difficult thing that's happened with a couple of my clients. It's just the support isn't the same and it's just a shame. And, you know, people, since they're in fear now and, and, and fear is, you know, such a, such a monster for people in recovery, you know, there's a lot of fear, the energy, for my clients is so different when I am in the hospital mm -hmm. and the, it's just so fear-based. So yeah. 
it's really messing with people in recovery and mental health because I treat both. So, yeah. Oh, and they go hand in hand, right? Of right. Course. Okay, I want to interrupt. We have our first caller, Kurt. Okay. Hello, caller. Are you here? Hello, caller. Welcome to Between the Sheets. Anything? Kurt, anything? I have them on. 858 Hello? area code. You're on the air. Hello, caller. Speak or forever hold your peace. We will hang up on you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, hang up, hang up on him. He'll, I'm hanging up it, on him. Whatever. All right. So, um, Rachel, how do you deal with, like, for example, um, addiction? Like, do you think everybody has somewhat of an addictive personality? Um, no, you know, what we've known in the last couple of years is that it is a disease. It is a biological disease. It, you know, it's genetic, it's environmental. Um, but not everybody has that personality because there's many people I'm sure you know can have a glass of wine on a Friday night, not think about it again. Might have smoked in college and never picked that back up again. Um, so, you know, it's not that everybody has it, but the people that do, um, you know, you, it, they really need people who understand that this is not just about willpower. You know, I buried a 26 year old brother to this disease, oh, oh, which is sorry. why I dedicated my entire career to, to doing what I do. Um, and it's not, it's not about willpower. You know, any of us at one time or another might say like, I, I am have autoimmune issues and I have celiacs and, you know, I know if I eat gluten or certain things, I'm going to be sick. And there have been times when I, you know, previously wrestled with, oh, it's just one time. That's the rationalization that goes on in yeah. the mind. It's just yeah. one time. Yeah. It's not going to hurt me. But my one time could land me in a hospital. Easy. So until you become disciplined and understand that the consequences aren't worth. You oh. Okay. She just stuck. Mm -hmm. All right. Rachel, if you can hear us, you may have to call back in, but that's not a problem. We'll just continue oh. on. Yeah, sometimes, okay. sometimes clicking uh, the video off will strengthen the, the uh, bandwidth, and then she can come back on. Oh, yeah. there you are. There you are. Oh, I'd like, are you, I'd like, oh hi, you're back. Rachel, you're back. I have a question for you. Actually, it's a two-part question. Okay. Um, can you explain the difference between an addiction and a habit? And do you think it is possible for somebody who has previously had an addiction to turn that into a habit? Um, you know, I think the difference is, is when you talk about addiction, generally there are pervasive negative consequences. And, you know, it, it's not just for the person, you know, the one lie that every addict tells themselves when they're in the throes of active addiction is I'm not hurting anybody but myself. And that's a big, bold lie because you're hurting everybody around you that loves you and supports you and counts on you and family members that don't want to see you die. Um, and a habit, it can be benign. Maybe somebody who picks their nails, right. Or, or bites their fingernails. They're not going to die. I mean, a and lot of people are addicted to exercise, for example. Well, yeah, I mean, that's very, very pervasive in this field. You know, there's obviously we know about eating disorders and restricting and, and purging, but there are many women that are addicted to exercise. And, and, so, and, and by the way, there are a lot of people addicted to people, bad relationships. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. gay and this is what yeah. I was going to yeah. <laughs> Just addiction, saying. <laughs> addiction is a behavior. Addiction isn't the substance. It's not the drink of choice. It's not, you know, the sex, even though that becomes, you know, an addiction or the gambling. It's the solution to the problem for them. Mm. So addiction is about covering up. So when I have groups and I travel all over doing interventions, like all over the world, I've been doing that for 15 years, you know, and it doesn't matter what the behavior is. And I tell people this all the time because the common denominator is spiritual, emotional pain when we're devoid of something that we need and we can't find it. So, you know, you can pick up, but that's not the problem. The problem, again, is the trauma. Many, many, many 
people who suffer with addiction have had trauma, trauma in their life. But the problem is sometimes you don't recognize the lay person doesn't understand and they'll say, no, well, I've never had trauma because maybe they weren't physically abused. But, you know, divorces cause trauma for mm. children, you know. Um, Sandra, you had a question? Yes. Uh, my question is, I've had a few friends who are clean and sober mm -hmm. and years and years and some, you know, uh, a few years. But I've also okay. had friends who say who say they were alcoholics and and or they were on another substance. And then they're like, but right now I just smoke weed, but I'm still clean and sober. And then you have other addict friends fighting with them going, I mean, I've been like going, ladies, ladies, because they're like, <laughs> that's not clean. Well, who are you to tell me? Uh, and then right. they go back and forth and well, Sandra used to smoke cigarettes. I'm like, whoa, 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 what the, why, how did I get dragged in? Right. <laughs> so, um, so you know, can you explain uh, somebody who is clean uh, or clean and sober, what exactly that means? And sure, are sure. they clean and sober if they still smoke weed? Okay. So originally what we had to help with addiction was what everybody knows, which is NA and AA and those type of 12 step resources. So within the confines of the 12 steps and 12 traditions and how they work, what they call the rooms, you know, which is NA and yep. all, those, all those meetings, you know, it was created to be based on abstinence. And so a lot of people get stuck because maybe something that they're doing isn't necessarily complete abstinence, but their life is manageable. I don't think anybody gets to make that decision for anybody else. Hmm. But I think the stigma came from the from like I said these meetings that said oh wait you you relapsed on this or or you there are many people in those rooms that don't even believe in antidepressants there are people who are stabilized on marijuana and you know they haven't shot themselves in the arm with heroin for years I don't think anybody gets to One decide <laughs> you know what that means everybody needs to have a personal opinion about it and what it means for them especially now with all this MAT, which is medication assisted treatment, right? So there's Suboxone, there's Vivitrol, you know, there's all it these- sound like video games. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard of these. <laughs> um, I played so Vivitrol. It really <laughs> depends because again, it's about bad behaviors and bad consequences. Who am I to say if somebody stays on Suboxone for a long time and now has a good job, right? And now is not having any issues in their family dynamic, you know, they're not stealing money anymore for heroin, but they're on Suboxone and it's keeping them, you know, feeling good, having no cravings and they're managing life. But don't you think it's important beyond the Suboxone to get their mental health regulated as well? 100%, 100%. Okay. And what we always say, did you want to say something, Gail? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay. We always say that the only real treatment is if you're going to do medication, you need the therapy. Yeah, you need to balance yes. it out, right? Because, I mean, yes. exactly, Because, Cheryl. again, the drug is not the problem. It's the behaviors. Exactly, because it's self-medicating. I mean, all these substances right. and addictions are all just self-medicating a pain or a trauma. And I talk about this all the time. I mean, I do these live Facebook things and I, I have an addictive personality, um, a smoking um, and women. Um, but, you know, and smoking women and smoking, and smoking women. <laughs> my, my women are all smoking. Okay? I'm <laughs> just That's smoking out is right. But I'm just saying it's kind of like, you know, it's it's interesting because I go and I go, what what is it in me? that allows this to continue and have these right. repetitive patterns. Right. And, you know, seriously, I mean, I think about it and it's hard, you know, cause we would have to, you have to admit to yourself sort of what the trauma yes. is, what the yes. this, what the that is. And, you know, and it's hard to admit it because it's kind of, sometimes I believe like a weakness that you don't want to admit the weakness. So if you do, so, and it makes you less of, cause then it becomes, well, then obviously I, I didn't cope, but it's actually you're hiding the trauma and you're med self-medicating really not to deal with the issue. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's even like a whole nother ballgame. And when you talk about, you know, people having emotional addictions, there are people that are addicted to love, addicted yeah. to, yes. you know, intimacy. 
And, you know, it just depends on what's underneath. A lot of women that behave like that lack self-esteem if they continue to have these unhealthy, toxic relationships, and then they get out of them, and then they find themselves in another one, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it's a lot of time with women. It is low self-esteem, and it has time a lot of times with how they were raised. You know, what was that message? What was the narrative when you were growing up? And I don't care if you're 20, 30, or 40, we can all behave in ways based on those old narratives from, you know, our, our parents or society. I so. mean, there has to somehow, I mean, I think tying in to um, like, like, okay, for example, if someone comes to you, okay, and says they have an addiction, I mean, do you like, do you like sit there and deal with the underlying cause? I mean, do you go to that route or bring them back and sort of what modalities and stuff do you use in your practice? Um, well, I mean, and there's a ton out there. So some of the things that I enjoy working and that I find that is really helpful is what is called um, CBT, DBT, solution focused. I believe, I, I don't always feel like I have to take somebody all the way back you know, to the actual events and relive, you know, how yeah. old psychiatrist on the couch, you know, a lot of times it's about pointing out where the resilience is and, and where your strengths are, and then using that to get you to the next step. And people have to understand it is a process, a long process. It's not one event. And then it turns over. It really is about unraveling, you know, like we say, the layers of the onion and peeling them back. But finding out, for me, what I find works is always talking about strength-based things and then understanding barriers, mm -hmm. you know? So we, we really like to focus on what you do well and, and where your strength is. And if you can connect to that, you can have more motivation to understand that you can do something with your life. Sandra. But I have a question uh because I, I used to watch these uh, reality shows, and you know that reality show intervention. Of course, I, I work with them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I watched it a couple times, and I, it just seemed to me like, to me, okay, it just to me, to wow. a normie, that it, it was so shame, like they, it felt shame based to me. Like, look how horrible you're treat, and I understand. I'm not dissing anyone. I'm not. I understand the family members have to get it out. And this is, I feel this also because it's a family thing, but mm -hmm. I just kind of felt like, damn it. I'd want to run out of there too. If everybody is telling me how I, <laughs> I'm like, well, you did this to me. You did that. You're like, screw you all. I'm out of here. Like, yeah, see ya. it just feels like <clears throat> it's how, and I'm sure there's a lot of success cases, but to me from the outside, how is that, um, who oh. came up with that way to uh, what seems like an attack to the addict of how, what a horrible way you're making me feel that it's that's kind of like tough love. I mean, it's kind of like that tough love technique, correct? You know, yes. But, am I wrong? But I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking, uh, obviously it works for some. Um, I just don't know how that is the most effective. I'm just at what, okay. What are your thoughts on that? Because <laughs> Because right. it just, so, if I was the addict, I'd be all, I'd want to kill myself. Like I heard all these people and I want to get the fuck out of here. So I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at that. And, you know, for TV, you know, they make it a little bit expansive, but the truth is, because I have literally been doing interventions for so long and there are different models. And as a matter of fact, um, everybody on that TV show uses the same model that I use. Um, but what you're seeing is just this snapshot of today, right? But yeah. if you have already brought in an interventionist, then the behavior has been there for very, very, very long time. So it's not about, and, and when I owned my treatment center, not my outpatient practice, when I owned my treatment center and patients were coming in to stay in, the one thing that I absolutely insisted on was all my staff had to show everybody love and respect and 
and treat them with dignity, it, you know, because yes, they already come in broken and battled from what you're saying about the family. But mm -hmm. chances are, once you're at the point of an intervention, um, they have done so many things that the family is now at a loss. Right. So what has to happen is that the client, the patient really needs to hear, like somebody said, tough love, the truth. But the way that you go about the intervention is always with, we love you. You know, okay. yeah. I always make my, my, fa I meet with my families the day before they have to write their paper. Um, but we always come from a place of, we love you. And this is why we're here, but it, it is okay for the family member to remind the person gently you have, you don't know. There's so many families like that have lost their homes because they've mortgaged them three times to help oh. their that's so terrible to hear. Oh, my goodness. It is horrible. Sandra, I think it's time for a song. What do you think? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Out of nowhere, I just cuz. <laughs> you got a song? Change. You got a I song? I mean, I, get, I, I wasn't prepared. Well, you have to showcase all your talents on Between the Sheets, not your knowledge. <laughs> what? Like, I wasn't prepared. I don't even have a... <laughs> it's okay. We'll move on. You just pick a song. I have a question, though. I saw I you, Delicia, but I, my question is, because everybody, I, Cheryl's quiet, yep. Mara's quiet, Cara's quiet, Kim's quiet. I want you guys to get involved. I know I know a lot of you personally. Yeah. Um, it's not my business to divulge anything about your lives, but I want you guys to speak up because I think all of us here, we all have addictions at some point. We all do. We're addicted to something. Cheryl, maybe not you because you walk on water. But other than Cheryl, I think <laughs> everybody else um, has dealt with some addiction. And it's not necessarily, you know, alcohol or pot or this or that. But I'd like to sort of, you know, everyone talk about it. Because if we're going to engage in a conversation, and this is the time to be aware, you know, we're here. We're functioning. We're working through it. You know, there is no shame to being an addict. I think that's what goes back to you, Sandra. You know, they're pigeonholed and they're like talk down to you and, and all that other stuff. I think it's something that's normal. It's part of life. It's part of what we go through. Maybe I'm one. Maybe I have my best friend. Maybe my mother, my father. My mother was, I mean, my mother doesn't care, but my mother was a gambling addict. I mean, she lost a shit ton of money. And I will not, because this is my mom, I will not go into personal stories, but it really did a problem. It, it had a problem with the family. Um, and if my mother could come out here, I'd have her tell it because she has no problem being on camera. So, but my point is, but she's deaf and then she'd be screaming and be a mess. But anyway, um, I would like everyone to sort of, you know, let every, I want everyone to know that we're just like them. You know, we have yeah. issues, we have problems. So I'll start with you, Cheryl. Yeah. What's I your, mean, what, what's your addictive, what's your addiction? And I, you could say chocolate. Know. You probably say chocolate. No, I, I would say it might be eating though right now, just because the coronavirus thing and being indoors. Like I, I have never had so much sugar in my life though right now. I don't know if it's an addiction, but I, it's really something I got to think about stopping because it's not like me or something, you know, it's almost like filling the void or filling yep. the gap. And it lowers your immune that? system. Boredom. And pardon? That's probably yeah. a trigger for you is the boredom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that's exactly. a perfect example. And you can just exactly. tell, I can tell how, how irritable I get too off of it. Right. I, it's, it's like a drug. I I'm telling you, it's like, uh, it, it's all, you can start feeling the craving happening. The sugar. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Are you complete? You addict you? <laughs> I'm awful. <laughs> Sugar's okay. a big one. There's been so many books written about sugar and how I know, and I the know elements of sugar inside of your brain mm -hmm. equate to the same thing as heroin when yes. it breaks down. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You, Mara, you what's your addiction besides your kitty? <laughs> um, you know what? Code for something? I, yeah. I have um I have an addiction <clears throat> and I'm lucky that I wasn't in all seriousness, I wasn't born genetically. I wasn't prone to anyone in our family being an addict. Um, it's it's environmental and it's also in the genes. And I'm really lucky that I haven't, um, well, I had a best friend that passed away from being an addict. 
and it was intensely it was the most intense horrible thing I've ever been through Mm. and I first went to uh you know the 12-step groups the anonymous so maybe I'm not supposed to say it on the air but um uh codependence anonymous was one I went to for myself but because that deals with it's just like dealing with relationships and people um so I went to that one first and that was the first time I ever really understood all about the serenity prayer and what an acceptance and you know all those concepts I hadn't heard them before so yeah and then my best friend simultaneously was getting worse and worse with her addiction so I went to Al-Anon which is for friends and family of um you know of addicts well, thank you Mara for sharing Cara hey, Mara you Mara you seem to be addict adjacent <laughs> probably I mean I get really addicted to um painting and and my passions but I don't really know what else I'm addicted to well maybe sometimes people but I think everyone has that but using that term lightly is different it's it's not right. the same thing exactly yeah. Cara and you what's your addiction miss I've always been addicted to chocolate I don't call that an addiction that's just who I am I just that doesn't worry me um but it doesn't seem to drive me too crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've just come out of a long relationship where I found I was a codependent. I didn't really even know what that was before that. And that includes being a love addict. So this is all actually yeah. quite new to me. Um, and I been, have been doing a lot of work on it and I'm doing a lot of reading on it and I do therapy and everything else. Um, so, but yes, in fact, since I started this show, a lot of interesting things have happened in my life. <laughs> <laughs> when I started this show, I was happily married. I am now divorced and a codependent. What happened? <laughs> well, better than being, you know, married and a codependent and if you weren't happy. You know, right. so you know I thought I was happy. I mean, you know, I just, but I, it, it, I see this sickness. And I was, I was sucked into something that's called a trauma bond. And it is a very, very dangerous place to be. And um, I'm very lucky. Here I am alone with my cats. <laughs> like, 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 you should be a lesbian. Um, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. Sandra, you're up. What? What's your addiction? <laughs> um, uh, I love smoking cigarettes. Uh, I used to smoke a pack a day when I was like younger, <clears throat> super young in my 20s, a lot. And I, but but even but I'm glad that I kind of went, you know, this is a little bit too much and I stopped doing it. And now I can smoke when I go out and maybe, you know, here and there. But I, I really love smoking cigarettes. Wow. I, I love How cigarettes. How can you do that? How can I mean, people be a smoker and only do it now and again when they fancy? I am so happy that I could do that because in, my, in the past I couldn't. <laughs> now I'm like. Yeah, sure. Like if I'm on vacation or if I get angry with my girlfriend, I'll go and walk a mile to get a pack of cigarettes and <laughs> and whatever. Uh, and I love sugar. I love snacks. I just love sugar. I love cookies. I love candy. Sugar babies. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but I'm also codependent. I realized that uh, seven years ago when I had a breakup and my somebody suggested I go to Coda and I went, but I'm not. I'm very independent. I'm not codependent. <laughs> <laughs> I might be ACOA, but I'm not no codependent. Then I get there and I'm all, holy shit. <laughs> and, you know, you're not supposed to talk in some meetings. And I was all like, but wait a minute. What is this about the advice thing? If I have good advice, why can't I give it? And they're like, because no one asked for it. Right. So like, Who gives a shit? That's not being codependent. That's being Mexican. <laughs> That's being a Latina to help fucking people. Be careful. There's a hole there. You're going to fall into the hole. You just fell into the hole. Oh, well, so like, but, but people have a mis people have a misunderstanding about what codependency is. Right. And then I read the book and I'm all like, God damn. Okay. Here's no. a funny story about the book. So I buy the book and I'm what in book? mobile. The Coda book. Oh, Coda there's a Coda no book. More. I don't know. Coda, okay. There's a Codependent No More book. So By I Melanie Beattie. Huh? By Melanie Beattie. Yes. 
Yes. And so I go to the cashier and this young girl and I see a stack of books like right next to her. And I go, hmm, see, it's a really good book. And she goes, yeah, this lady bought all these books for her friends, but her friends didn't want them. So she returned them. And I <laughs> died laughing and she didn't get it. And I go, you don't get it. It's a book about codependency and she bought it for her friends. Mm -hmm. Got it. And nobody wanted it. it. She goes, okay. I'm like, okay. I can forget it. <laughs> forget it. <laughs> that was just you know, people often hear the term codependent and think what it means is that they are consistently dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. but that's not really what it means. No, it's not. What, what is the definition, Rachel? Yeah, the definition of codependency is when you give up so much of yourself to please somebody else so that it's not that you're dependent. It's that your happiness depends on you doing everything for them. So all and Mexican women, <laughs> Italians, Italians too, Glenn. Italians too. You know, yeah. there, there's a difference in doing things for your partner and your lover, but not at the expense of yourself. Of yourself. Right. Of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I may. That's I'm very important. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say the the biggest thing I learned in these twelve step programs is to keep the, they, you go in there rattled with all these focuses on other people, whether it's the, uh, the addict or whether it's the, you know, your person you're dating or your, whatever it is, it's never focused right. on you. And a lot of this, what I learned in the 12 step groups is to turn the focus back on myself, because that's again, right, Rachel, that's the only mm -hmm. thing that I can control is right. uh, you know is is my and then also the serenity prayer which i really wanted to love talk about because that's the heart of it all really okay let me take a break two seconds we do have a caller i'm ready hey again it's ursula hi ursula from florida how are you sweetheart <laughs> i'm doing okay um i was calling in and this is going to be kind of hard um, I've been recovered. Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic 20 years plus. Um, and then well, congratulations. Kind of it. Oh, thank you. Um, but my recovery, I guess, um, I kind of had an experience. It wasn't like I decided to get sober. It was like one night I was laying in bed and I know a lot of people are not going to believe this, and this is why I don't tell this story often, but I had been drinking the night before. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was sober by this time, and I had this, what I call God, I had the spirit come to me at the end of the bed, and God said to me, you will never drink again, and it faded, and I I, I just sat up. I sat, I sat up in the bed and I said, oh my gosh. And, and it lifted. It lifted off of me. Like, mm. like n nothing else. I like nobody that. else could say I anything to me. Yep. Well, I believe well, that. Well, Cheryl would know that because that's what Cheryl does. She talks to dead people and stuff. So, well, it's a visitation. <laughs> you know, it's a visitation. It's not just a dream, it's an experience. Uh, no, it, yeah, it, it was total. It was a total experience. And it was. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's a, a spiritual um, awakening. Well, yeah, was, I mean, it changed my life. Well, and I'm now you're better for you. it. So that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And we're all, we're all, I mean, I applaud you, Ursula. A, I applaud you conquering it and b i applaud you for speaking about it because you thank will you. inspire others so thank you yes congratulations well, you know that's amazing thank to you mm -hmm. okay ursula i'll well, see you tonight other? on my facebook live okay, hon. <laughs> bye. Okay, hon. bye bye all right so before we go on i do want to go around because rachel i know um we've got a couple more and then i want to just talk about it and sandra prepare a song um, Delisha, <laughs> what's your addiction? <laughs> um, addiction, I don't know. That's why I asked the question earlier. So I used to be very addicted to weed. And um, I actually started smoking weed when I was eight years old. Whoa. And I was smoking it daily by the time I was 13. Um, <clears throat> and I stopped when I was 
I don't know, probably 30, round about 30, 31, and I gained uh -huh. 100 pounds. Um, mm -hmm. But I quit for 15 years, and no problem. I actually, it was two years of me waking up and basically beating myself up every day, saying I'm not going to go smoke pot today, and every day I would go smoke pot. And it was two years of that over and over and over again. And then I quit for 15 years. And then uh, I got sick again. Trump became president. Uh, my girlfriend and I broke up. Pot became legal. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. And my, my doctor said, you should try and smoke, take CBD for your, for your pain. And I was like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I'm an addict. But I was actually able to take my addiction. And it took a couple of years to do this because as soon as I started smoking again, it was like addiction, even CBD. I felt it. And I was like, oh, I, feel, I remember this. Hi, old friend. You know, so it was like it took me a couple of years, but I was actually able to overcome the addiction and I smoke it every day, but I don't feel like it does anything negative. It's actually a huge positive in my life. I have mucho, mucho gratitude for cannabis and it has saved my life on numerous occasions. And I know that, but I'm lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones that, that I don't have, like I could leave for a month and not think about it and I'm okay. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks Delisha for sharing. And now we'll get to Kimberly Sanchez. Well, I have a very complicated relationship with addiction. Um, I think that the addiction is actually to self-loathing. I don't think it's to a substance. Mm -hmm. I think it's to self-hatred and I think it's to insecurity. And um, I, I have been... I have been sober from every substance for six years, four years, three years, and then I've been addicted to every substance, cocaine in the 80s, um, pot in high school. Um, alcohol is a huge crutch for me if I'm needing to check out um, food, people. I mean, I think the only thing I've never done is like cigarettes and gambling. Um, but I Those don't, are the easy ones. I know, right? I no longer <laughs> feel like it's about the substance itself, because I could, I could take every substance out of my life and be addicted. I got addicted to work. I got addicted to a relationship where I lot anything that you're losing yourself in, but then you kind of have to go, why am I losing myself in this? I mean, why? And I think that somehow is, is the key to, to where the addiction is. I don't know. What do you, Rachel, how do you feel about that? You you were frozen or I was frozen for a little while. But I think what you're asking is, is why do you end up back relying on these things? And, you know, as I listen to you, like the way that I felt, it's about it's about self-soothing. Mm -hmm. And so when we don't know how to sit with ourselves and sit in our own skin and be OK and experience feelings that maybe aren't so wonderful, but with the understanding is that there's always going to be a way out. So if we haven't learned how to self-soothe, that's why all of that comes into play. And that is why probably doesn't matter what it is. Like I was saying at the beginning, it's not about the substance. It's about the behavior. So you're looking at, and you shared, and I am honored that you would share that here, you know, about feeling like you self-loathe and, you know, have such this test for within yourself. And when, so when that happens, you know, you're, you're looking at other things just to take you away because you're in pain. Mm -hmm. And when we are in emotional and spiritual pain, until we understand that it's very hard to cope and deal with those things. Mm -hmm. you know, and have, have you been in therapy? Me? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Rachel. I mean, I've been in therapy. I've done, I've done AA and I'll tell you something about the only thing I adore the 12 steps because I think mm -hmm. that the 12 steps, when you do them, whether you're addicted or not, whether you're a, a normal person or not, right. those 12 steps, right. Yep. Your yep. life. Yes. Like, uh, doing a, doing a fourth step and, and right. making amends and, go, you know, it's just, it's, it's, if they taught that in school, I was, um, that's what I yeah. said. To be taught in elementary school. Yeah. I also, if I'm, can I say something? Mm -hmm. 
I also feel that um, there's a mystique, there's some sort of mystery to why some people can recover and others can't like my best friend, because she was always in and out of uh, recovery. She was always reading the blue book. Then she would do fine. She would relapse all, you know, every, all the time. And then it, what's weird is that her stepdad actually was going on 25 years sober. He, he was able to do it. So I don't know, Rachel, if you can speak on what makes some addicts able to recover and what, why some, no matter how, much they want to and how much they try it's just I, I don't know if you can even answer that well I mean this is in my experience so you know there's generally a foundation of I want to get sober I don't want to live like this anymore but what I know and it's for it, it could be the same for me as yes I want to be like a size two again and I want my abdomen to be really tight and flat but if I don't go to the gym and I don't do the exercise and I don't watch what I eat, right, that's not going yeah. to happen. So it's about doing the work and, and we are all created differently. And so some people can be very disciplined when they decide they want recovery and they go to therapy, they take their medications, they go to meetings, they humble themselves, they ask for help, they work with sponsors and they really delve in to what their hearing needs to happen to achieve sobriety. I have a best friend who like, she's one of those ones that we call a one hit wonder. I mean, 15 years ago when I helped her get sober, like she just never relapsed. Yeah, that, And it's because, awesome. and it's because she was not going to give in. She was going to do all the work. A lot of people focus on how do I not pick this drug up? How do I not pick this drink up? But again, remember I was telling you, it comes back to being in the solution and, and knowing what you're resilient. And so working that way, because you have to do the work. You can't want to get thin and it happens. You know, you can't want to do a lot of things and it just appears. It's always about work and how hard are you willing to work for something? Rachel, and you know, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Because how do you explain then my situation, for example, I was clearly I was an addict and I would wake up every day and lie to myself and beat myself up. And then one day I woke up after two days of not being able to find weed and I was done. I didn't go to any meetings. I didn't do any like work that I right. of anyway. Not back then. I have now, but right. I, I just like, I don't get it. Well, you know, Again, it's about genetics and it's about hard wiring because addiction is about the, the loops and the hard wiring in the brain. And we know that as we have been able to understand more through the years about addiction as it being a genetic biological disease. So if, if there was, let's say, a lab test that I could give you, right? And it would say if it was positive for Q, you would be an addict. And if it's negative for Y, you might not be. You know, maybe you're just not um, genetically wired that way. But because I can't show you other than somebody who drinks a lot when I can show them that their liver is in trouble and their liver enzymes are really bad and I can, you know, show that to somebody so they can get some kind of understanding. Well, here's a tangible piece of information that can make somebody go, okay, wait. But for the most part with addiction, it's not the same as like when somebody has cancer. I can't show you a tumor. I can't show you lab work that says you're an addict or not. Mm -hmm. When I hear stories like that, my first thought is you just might not be wired for addiction. And also I think there's a maturity too. So, you know, I partied my ass off at University of Miami. I partied my ass off for years, you know, and I even partied with my brother that I lost. But after a Saturday or Sunday, I went back to school or I went back to work and, you know, life just progressed. And, you know, I, I did a lot of, you know, ecstasy when it first came out, but I'm just not wired that way, as I understand, because I'm not, I don't have any addictive, you know, behaviors. And so maybe you're just not, maybe maturity came in, because a lot of times I find that people that are in treatment, sometimes, you know, the truth is, after you do a lot of the scaling and the work and the understanding it's not even about addiction so much as it is they needed to mature 
you know, and grow into this rational thought process of like, yeah, I can't spend my days and my money just smoking weed and doing any, doing nothing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Everybody, you're watching Between the Sheets podcast. Very heavy show tonight. We're on the first and third Friday of every month here on United Broadcasting Network. I hope you're enjoying this. We have wonderful, love, lovely comedian Sandra Valls and Rachel Simpson, who obviously is an addiction specialist. Please call us 323-524-2599. And we do have a caller. Hello, caller. Are you there? Yes. Hello, hello. Hi, who's calling? Uh, this is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> what would you like to say? Um, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get called on, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I've been going to 12-step meetings for a really long time, um, and it's for Al-Anon. It's not for a particular addiction, except I've been addicted to addicts. Yeah. And it has been uh, interesting because, and I've read several Melody Beattie books, and in one of her first books, she states that it, there's very little difference between the addict and the codependent. They both mirror and have the same issues. Um, so it's, it's the same thing. They're both trying to just numb out from their lives and not deal with what's going on is really what it is. They're trying to find a distraction from themselves. And that's what I feel anyway. Can I so, just say something here? I, I agree with you because <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I, I'm addicted. I'm an addict. I'm an addict to love. I'm an addict to bad relationships. I just am. And I do see it within myself, which is why, you know, <clears throat> I try to get more spiritual because I think when, because they are a mirror of me. I mean, what I see in them, what they trigger me, which triggers me to smoke more or triggers me to whatever the hell else I'm going to do. It is that mirror mm -hmm. thing. And <clears throat> it's just, um, I mean, I do find, sp I, I mean, I, I look to spirituality and not religion, but spirituality to get through that. And, you know, so, I mean, is that what sort of you're saying? I am. You're That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That it really comes down to that we, that, you know, people that are, grow up, in dysfunctional families, whether they're alcoholics, my mother was schizophrenic, but um, whatever it is that started off your family of origin that created this, it really comes down to filling that hole. You have a gaping hole and you're just filling it up and it's until you start learning to start healing that part is in when those addictions become less and less. I agree. And that's, well, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Well, thank you for calling. I'll have Rachel answer. Then I know Cheryl had wanted to say yeah. something and Sandra's going to give us a song. So we've got the order of what we're doing here. So Rachel, can all you right, speak? Great. Thank you so much for calling Thanks, in. I appreciate Rachel. it. Oh, you're welcome. All right. So, okay, uh, you know, again, just, just going off of what we've already said, it is, it is not about the substance or the behavior. It is absolutely filling a void. It is covering up the trauma, covering up the pain. We always say the drug is not the problem. It is the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. And even bad behaviors and bad relationships and that that pull to toxicity and, and narcissistic people. You know what? It's just another kind of drug. No, not the N word. God damn it. It has to come up. It has to come up. But you know, it, and it makes sense. It, it is the pull to all this chaos that helps us distract ourselves from what the real issue is. And you said it beautifully because I, and I said before, you are devoid of a spiritual presence. And so when, and a lot of people have a tough time, they're like, well, I don't believe in God. So this doesn't work for me. It doesn't have to be God. It can be anything, but believing in a power greater than yourself, an energy 
And it's out there. It's out there for all of us. And we become comfortable with that. Then the addiction can dissipate because we become stronger. Exactly. Uh, Cheryl, you, ha well, Cheryl Rachel, you had your hand up. You know, my question, Rachel, is what about gender? Like, have you noticed more men than women or lately more women, more women than men, you know, with the addictions? I mean, what, what are you seeing in the work that you're doing? Is it, is it a well, big difference or big shift happening? I'll t no, uh, you know, the trend has always been at any given time in any facility, there's generally more men than women, but I'll tell you why. I mean, this is my belief and colleagues and I have talked about this through the years is that the guys don't get to go as long without there being really bad consequences, but the women can use and a lot of to understand people don't end up in rehab because they wake up one morning and they go, you know, I want to be told when to pee. I want to be told what I'm going to eat. I want to be told when I have to wake up. Ah, I'm so excited. I want to go to rehab. But guys end up generally with more consequences. And that's how people generally get into treatment to begin with. We call them external motivating factors. You know, if they're not parents or loved ones or the law, there's something else going on. But women can maintain a lot longer because, you know, men are willing to support women like that. I can get her to do anything. I just pay for her drugs and I, and I give her money. And, you know, the, it's a very, very strange dichotomy the way it, it is sliced and diced. So there's, you know, men don't have that. When men run out and there are men, solid, solid straight men that will cry and tell you stories of things that they've done they would never do if they you weren't. explain lesbians then? Yeah, exactly. Hello. But um, Sandra, I mean, Sandra just uh, private messaged me that you said there's a good book by a comedian. Uh, the, my very, very good friend, Amy Dresner, uh, who is in recovery, she's hysterical. One of her things that helped her uh, maintain uh, her recovery, she wrote a book, a memoir about her life called My Fair Junkie. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I got to say, I picked it up to support her and I started reading it. And it was at the same time hilarious but heart-wrenching yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because she was so raw and honest. Uh, and as I'm reading it, I had to remind myself, whoa, 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 this is my friend. I had no idea. I mean, there was so, I, and I feel like crying right now because it was just, it's so honest. And so uh, unlike any, any book on uh, the subject that I've ever read, uh, it's called My Fair Junkie by Amy Dresner. She's hilarious, even as just a mm -hmm. person like, you should have her on because she's just so brilliant. But I have but I have a question, and I will, and, and certainly give her my number. But, you know, comedians, um, you know, I've worked with my share, and um, they're very neurotic and insecure. And a lot of the comedians that I've worked with. Right here, I can hear you. <laughs> Sandra, not you. Not you. Um, I mean, but I'm talking about really well-known. I mean, oh, they sorry. are. Excuse me. <laughs> I, can, I still can hear you. I can't mention their names, but you are. I'm talking about. But I mean, they do this facade, you yes. know, and and it's it's out there, and but they're really in pain, which is you know, mm -hmm. humor comes from pain. I mean, right. let's think about it. Right. I mean, I'm oh, funny. That's... I'm not a comedian. I am funny, but my most funny things come from painful experiences that I can laugh about because that's the way I can handle it. So Sandra, as a comedian and you based your comedy on your life, I mean, I mean, is it, is it out of some pain and that's the way your, your therapy of sort of sharing or no, or, or, or are you just fucking funny? <laughs> I'm just fucking funny. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it's how I, I don't, I understand that, yes, just like any good so Adele song might come from some pain, but also good songs come from your life and your happy moments and your and your ability to observe and take it in and get to know yourself and be an empath like I am and just be uh, just be always in touch with source and all these beautiful spiritual mm. things. Uh, certainly, humor helps when you're dealing with a challenging situation, and I think that some of us as a child developed that as a defense or as a kind of a uh, see how I can, uh, a way of dealing with it. Um, 
And so I do, yes, I think, and Rachel, you've seen some, a lot of my comedy at the Olivia trips and some of it's really funny and some of it comes from some pain that uh, you gotta be willing to come out and transform yeah. a heartbreaking thing into a mm -hmm. laughable thing. Like, you know, it's important. I've, I've reminded myself that through this whole ordeal with the coronavirus, um, our first instinct is to make a joke, not make light of it. There's a difference. Right. And I don't like comedians who take serious issues and make a mockery of it or light. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. Uh, but, you know, little things like I'm getting a Corona brow or like, you know, like just <laughs> things that I'm, that, that I'm noticing that I'm like right. doing, like, right. like I've, like I'm all full of like fun facts now. <laughs> well, I'll let you think about your fun facts and we've got a caller. So let's see who the caller is. Yeah. Hi Hello, there. It's, uh, Hello, Joe. welcome to Between the Sheets. Who's calling? Hi there, it's Joe Papadenitz. Hey, Joe Papadenitz, hey, how Joe. are you? I'm good. Um, I came on, I'm not sure if you've already mentioned um, this individual and I'm really glad that you are all kind of separating addiction from uh, trauma. There's a doctor in Canada, um, I'm sure you've heard of him, Dr. Gabo Mate, and a well-known addiction specialist. And he worked 12 years in downtown Vancouver with hardcore drug users. And what he found in all those 12 years working with them is that every single one of them was abused as a child every single one of them had childhood trauma and the, um, whether it was physical, emotional or sexual abuse. So he's taken, it's almost taken the word addiction out of it because it's, uh, he says it's really based on the trauma. You're not, like you're talking about, you're not ad addicted to the substance. You're addicted. You don't have an addiction. You've just found a coping mechanism. So, um, oh, is that fair to say, Joe, that do you think he's trying to say that every addict is trying to cope with trauma? Absolutely. That's what he says. He says he never met one that didn't have childhood trauma. I and he works a huge, 12 years with hundreds of patients. Every single oh. one of them did. Okay. Hold on, um, Joe. Hold on, Joe. Go ahead, Kim. What were you going to say? Well, no, I think that that's, I think that that's uh, probably dead on. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you that I was a victim of sexual assault as a three-year-old oh and I don't think it got any better after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So oh, sorry, yeah. Kim. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. again, it runs in families, you know, my sister too, uh, babysitters and, and, and what happens as a child, when you have something like that, you, because it doesn't, I don't know that it just happens once. And then you start to feel like you've got this label on your forehead that says, mm. yeah, fucking molest me. You know what I mean? And you, mm -hmm. you take it on. It's your fault. I mean, and Rachel, I'm sure you can attribute, attest to this as a child. If your parents get divorced, it's your fault. If something bad happens, it's your fault. So to have something that's happening like that to you and to take that in as your fault, you know, I mean, my sister didn't make it out of that. She died a junkie on a park bench uh, three and a half years ago, four years ago now. So, you know, it's big. Something I'd like to add on real wow. quick is we've learned that there's something now called generational trauma. So thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. thanks. You're welcome. Generational um, trauma. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that we don't actually have to, as the person experience the trauma, but they've done such amazing work to even understand how like fit relative. Uh oh, we lost your audio, Rachel. Same, because that was so good. Uh -huh. I know. I think what she's saying is that it just comes through to generations. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, I think so too. I mean, Rachel, um, I, your audio was off, not off, but it was, it's, it's uh, spotty. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What were you saying? So that, I don't know where I left it, but that generational trauma, um, we have 
uncovered the understanding that, for instance, people who have been in the Holocaust, like, you know, as the their generations behind them develop these addictions and develop severe anxiety, because, you know, all of those things are really, you know, go hand in hand with addiction. And they are saying that, you know, it the trauma is passed down because it becomes genetic in your genetic coding. So look, I have been in the field, I was saying 25 years, not every client I have ever, ever seen has had that kind of trauma. That's not been my experience in a very long time, but we can kind of go back through the family and see where there might have been, you know, an instance or something that could have, you know, been passed down. So it's generational trauma. And, you know, there's things, even the way that you are born and that day, the way you come into this world. Well, can I also say something very important that I don't feel has been touched upon? And that's that the biggest misconception that I see a lot of people that have not been through this. uh, You got to just stop this. It's not so so simple. Oh, well, yeah, that too. Exactly. It, it, you know, that's what I was going to say is basically if they loved me enough, they obviously right. love their addiction more than they love me. And right. the biggest, that's the biggest um, misunderstanding because this addiction, any addiction that some of these addicts are under, it, it's that they feel controlled by that addiction and it's not personal. And they could stop right. a lot of them, could stop if they want, but I, I think that the two biggest things here are um, feeling like you can like it, you can save someone, which is a huge misconception. You know, one likes to see their loved ones um, hit rock bottom and all that. But the biggest misconception, though, is that they can stop them. And that brings me to the three C's that I, we learned about in treatment. Uh, you didn't cause it. You can't control it. And you didn't create it. I think those are the three C's. But I think the hardest thing not to enter, just to add on that, Mara, I think some people like myself, you know, we're fixers, you know, we're fixers. We try to help. We don't want to see that playing off of what you say, Mara, but it is really hard to see people that we love go on this path and, and you try to be there for them. And if you're not, you know, if you don't know the trauma or you don't have the trauma or they're not willing to enlighten you to sort of where that is, you know, it's really hard. And I think as empaths, I think Mm -hmm. we all try to help and facilitate, but it is beyond anything above beyond that what we can do. We are not professional. And then you can see all this happening. And then, I mean, I was with, I wasn't with anybody, but I mean, I was working with someone who was an alcoholic and she was completely in denial. And I would say to her, and I never said, you're an alcoholic. You Mm -hmm. know, I said, you know, we've both been drinking a lot. You know, why don't we go to, have you know go to aa i'll we'll go together you know Mm -hmm. and that you know when you tell an alcoholic that they're not an out that you don't even have to say you're an alcoholic you can just bring the topic up they're in denial and i find out when any addict is in denial including myself i don't want to fucking hear it it's like Mm -hmm. i have to come to that that space to myself to go, I don't want to do this anymore. And the more people tell me not to do it, the more it's like, fuck you. I'm going to do it more. You can't tell me what to do. Well, that's why I had to, as many people do, I had to walk away from both alcoholics in my life. And it was really, really unbearable to walk away knowing that you could not save that person but that that's what you had to do because from my own sanity and my own protection, I, you have to grasp the fact that you really sincerely cannot save them. Yeah. And that's right. I mean, and it's not your job to save them. And my best friend died when I took, when I finally walked away and I said, I'm sorry, but you don't seem serious after all these, she would, she would relapse and then not, she just didn't seem like she was committed enough to, stick with it. And after 16 years, I finally said, I can't, I I want you to get serious and I can't be in this right now. I set a really strong boundary 
because I think I knew deep down that she was going to die and I didn't want to be there. Um, exactly. But Mara, but I, I have a question and I have a question for you, Rachel. So people that are the fixers, people that want to help, that want to save, um, you know, how do, if, if let's say they do die, how do we, I mean, I, 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 that's never happened to me and I always dreaded it. How, but I know that I would feel completely responsible for that. I know that guys, here's the thing. Like you, you all talk about it like that. Mm -hmm. And the truth is it's not up to us to judge them. And it's not up to us to get them to conform to our standards about what we think is right or what we think they should do. What if we just loved them the way they were? And if they die, they die, but at least we love them and we accept them exactly where they are. And I hate to bring it back to the coronavirus, but that is kind of how I'm feeling right now with some of my friends who are not practicing social distancing. I'm, I'm so angry, and I, but what can I do? I, I realized today, you know what, it's their life, and I can't change anything about that. So what can you well, do? I have two, two things to say about that. So I, I always believe that you should love the person, as you said, and I agree with you. You know, you have to love somebody just how they are. But the other side of that is when you are dealing with it enough, we have to be careful to not love them to death and to enable them. And so there's a lot of enmeshment that goes on. And, you know, I'm a mother of an 18 year old boy. And, you know, I can't imagine having to ever be the one to say, get out of my house, but you know, you have to understand truly how baffling and manipulative the disease is, not the person. And I often share with my clients and I have for years that it helps them a little bit more that they are not their di disease, right? They're not right. their di disease. You separate the person from the sickness. Yeah, definitely. Rachel, you froze, but you probably know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know she's trying to say something. Oh, that... Me? Nope. Still I was well, off. We could, we could do Sandra's song. Yeah, we could do Sandra's song. Sandra, Sandra has a very good choice for us tonight. It just a <laughs> tiny snippet. I changed my my I changed my song in the middle of it all. Okay. <laughs> because the conversation changed. And, all right. Uh, I think this is a really good. Uh, I'm going to sing a little bit. I wasn't prepared. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's got to be from my phone. So let me see if you all hear it. Okay. Okay. Can you hear it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Loud or soft? Can you it's hear fine. it? It's fine. It's fine. When you're down and out When you're on the street When darkness comes so I'll take the bow. Oh, when darkness comes, and when there's no one that you love around, just like a bridge. Oh. I will lay me down just like a bridge over trouble. I will lay me down. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, that was so beautiful. That was really beautiful. Wow. Amazing voice and soul. Whoa. You yeah. Feel your soul in there. That That's what I love about Sandra. I love that. We felt you so, so unexpected. I thought you were going to sing a comedy song. <laughs> beautiful. That was amazing, Sandra. Thank you, Mom. So, Sandra. Um, yes. Tell us, let's let's move off the addiction just for a second, but just because that was a nice transition. Um, so tell us about what you've been up to. Tell us about the play that you did in New York. I want to hear about that. So, uh, well, first of all, I've been up to, I just, I forgot to tell you that I recorded this um, video where my friend Deborah Barsha, who's an off-Broadway composer, she's like the musical director for Jersey Boys and... Tina Turner and Donna Summer, she wrote this song called We're Still Here for the Healthcare Workers. Mm -hmm. And we all recorded it a bit, a chunk in our house, like a We Are the World kind of thing. And it's out, it's on YouTube. I'll share it with you all. It's, Will you please, yeah. Share it to the healthcare workers because it's a tribute to them. Uh, but yeah, my show, the Latina Christmas special, uh, <laughs> it came out, this was like seven years ago. Uh, I had a horrible breakup uh, where I lost everything like everything, uh, 2013. And my friend, uh, Diana Yanis, who's also a comic, was mm -hmm. like, Kuka, let's write something, I'm all write something. I don't even want to take a shower, much less write something. <laughs> uh, my breakup was in October. And so she was like, let's just write something, Latina Christmas special, because we didn't grow up with Christmas specials that looked like me. I know I look white or Greek or Persian, but I'm Mexican. So everything was like white and Bob Hope and Donnie and Marie. And I grew up in the 70s. Uh, so she's like, let's just write about growing up in Christmas. So we wrote a little something in 2013 and the play grew. It's a, it's like three one woman shows, me, Diana and Maria uh, Kirby. Um, and it grew and grew and grew in five years. And last year we just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Diana's connections were in New York uh, in 2018. And they were like, do you have a demo of the play? We're like, yeah. And we were off Broadway last Christmas. Wow. I mean, oh. we were like, what? Like, we had 22 shows at the Soho Playhouse. Wow. We just kept doing it every year, and it kept growing, and the audience, and we got Critics' Choice in L.A., and wow. we just kept changing it and tweaking it and just being honest about our lives. And I talk about growing up in the 70s, a big lesbian in Laredo, Texas, and <laughs> we about, uh, growing up in Miami, Cuban, and... I'm Mexican and Maria's half Mexican and half Lithuanian in LA and just uh, the funny things and that happen in our lives. And uh, I sing in it. We dance, of course, we're, we're Latina. You gotta have sing and dance. And we <laughs> you know, shots. I know it's about addiction, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mexican. Uh, so we were just off Broadway last year and heaven knows what's going to happen this year. Let's hope this whole thing gets squashed so we can go back because we had sold out shows we were like well new york is full of you know play and if we get a few people at least we could at least put it in the resume right right we got like packed houses for, like 40 bucks a ticket i'm like they're paying 40 dollars to see it. Like, <laughs> uh, so that was great and right after that i came i did a a, a play in la called frida stroke of passion where i played chavela vargas uh, that's which, that's with Odalis Nanin, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, she wrote it, directed it. She was in it. She played Frida, and I played mm -hmm. Frida's girlfriend, Chavela Vargas, who's mm. a like this ranchera singer. She, she is like a Mexic a lesbian Mexican icon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was here to play Ro, but what am I up to? Just uh, enjoying where I am and looking forward to what's coming. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> developing. And if people. And if people tuned in late, what do you do every Saturday with your sister? Oh, yes. So we do uh, It's called Playroom Karaoke. Uh, and we sing songs like from seven to ten and we take requests and we we have a raffle and we because we were cleaning out the garage and I have a whole bunch of cool toys and cool stuff. And we were like, we can't Etsy this right now. I don't think anyone's <laughs> well, can we garage sale it? And I go, let's raffle it. And so. It's funny. It's funny, stupid things. But we do. We sing every Saturday at 7 p.m. Central and in the playroom. And just to keep our spirits up, it's important. The vibration we put out, it's important to, to, to stay in a kind of uh, uplifting, uh, higher vibration so that we can deal with 
things that come our way and not be so spongy all the time. Cause I know that I pick, I'm like, is this my emotion or is it everyone else's? Cause I was happy a minute ago, you know? Right. I think we're picking up on people's shit. I don't watch the news. Even if I scroll on Facebook, Not me either. I'm just Never. like, I I scroll on Facebook and the shit that I see. I mean, and it's a bunch of shit. A lot of it is a bunch of shit. Of shit. And, stuff, and I try, you know, I, 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 this, this one, a person that was talking spiritually, I forget where I saw him. He said, be careful what you put in your doors, mm. your mouth, your, you know, what you eat, what you think, what you watch. People mm -hmm. are still watching like, let's watch the handmaid's tale. I'm like, no, that's the <laughs> Yeah. What I start. I started watching Beverly Hills 90210, the original from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you That'll do it. Your putting your door. And delicious. And anything but Tiger King, because that's disgusting. Oh, no. <laughs> I've been do I've been doing Outlander, and I, it's five seasons. So th if this this Corona thing lasts. I will have seen the whole season, Cheryl. But I have a question for Cheryl because Cheryl is, you know, Cheryl is a medium. She's she's tuned in. This is her job. I have a funny comment for Cheryl. Just a yes. Yes. yes, yes. So Cheryl, I'm kind of sort of psychic too. Uh, kind of. I I hear and and I feel things. And in my rider, because I travel a lot, I have my contract. You know, snacks, water, whatever. Then I have accommodations, hotel, clean. And then it says in big bold letters, italicized and underlined must not be haunted <laughs> then I write, this is not a joke <laughs> i'm not even playing i'm like i will not stay in a haunted hotel like i have won't before. be able to stay at the glen tavern inn in santa paula then no yeah, man no. i travel with cigars and salt and shit yeah I'm like, wow <laughs> Bru brujeria um cheryl yes so considering you know, you're seeing it from a different angle. I mean, Rachel's Rachel's taking it from like an addictive angle. You've been doing, I've seen it all over Facebook. You've been doing a lot of readings and stuff with groups. What are you sensing? What are you getting from this time now with people? The energy. Uh, well, I got to tell you, I, I love it that uh, everyone's really thinking about keeping their vibration high. It's really important. But, you know, an observation that all of this is happening, right? We're all indoors now, right? So we're all in, we can't go out. So what's happening is everyone's going inward, right? Or at least most mm -hmm. people are, we're going inward. It's as if uh, one of our senses we don't have anymore. So we're opening up our other senses, you know, our inner sight, our inner feeling. And there's so much, uh, as Rachel was saying, there's so much spiritual awakening happening now. There's so many people waking up and so many empaths coming and realizing, hey, look, we are very sensitive beings. We are highly sensitive. And that's really one of the beautiful opportunities that's coming out of this. So let's not, you know, let's let's try to get those golden nuggets, you know, through chanting or, you know, meditation or or singing karaoke. You know, it is about raising that vibration and understanding that not only is it an I collective or it was an I collective, but now it's a we collective consciousness, right? It's a global community, right? So we are really all in this together, but there's so much more to each human being. It's, it's not, it's we're like, we're going to look inside each other's soul next time we see each other in person, you know, we're going to really take notice. And that's such a beautiful heart opening experience. There's a lot, a lot of beauty happening at the same time. Yeah. I also well, might add a little bit of something. I think that what we took for granted is now, you know, yeah. hopefully appreciated more, you oh, know? Definitely. You know, sometimes it takes you not having something to mm. kind of it appreciate. Truly and well, the, being the, able but to those are, but those are the ones in the store. Yeah, but those are the people that are truly evolved because an asshole is going to be an asshole is going to be an asshole no matter what the situation is. And I let right. them, and I, you know, I let, I give them and I allow them to go with love because no more assholes. I mean, it's seriously, I mean, like, like, look at the people and I'm not talking about anybody personally. I'm just talking about, look at those fuckers that are still like on Trump's bandwagon, those people, yeah. assholes. So, I mean, you know, you got to let them go with love and say, not, you know, namaste stay away, please. Um, <laughs> hey, get, hey, guess what people, guess what? It's an hour and a half. We're done. I told you guys it'd be over soon. An hour and a half. That I know. Great. So I know this is a heavy topic. Um, 
I appreciate everybody on the show bearing their souls, mm -hmm. bearing, just sharing, um, giving some love and light to people out there. Um, we are fortunate. I'm fortunate to have all of you in my life. And, and that's an amazing blessing. Um, and we don't have to talk every day. It's just, I know you guys are here and you guys are here for me as I am there for you. Um, so again, this is a really heavy show with a really wonderful topic. Rachel, I wanna say thank you. Um, I'm glad I sought you out on Facebook um, and I appreciate you imparting everything and giving everybody hope that an addiction is not a death sentence. There is hope. So I appreciate all you do because you are a healthcare worker and you are yes. still doing what you do. And I wanna say thank you because people like you in these times now are very necessary. So thank you for all you do. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You've all been so amazing. Thank you. Now, thank do you, you want to promote anything? Is there a website? Is there anything that if um, you do phone? Do you do phone things? What do you do? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know who's listening, but um, I'll shout out my number because I travel anywhere for interventions and um, I do uh, like concierge recovery services as well in the home. So um, the number is 305-450-9941. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. 9941. Hold yeah. on. All right. 305. I'm putting it on the, on the feed as we're doing it. 305-450-9941. Yes. Correct. So even if it's somebody who needs placement and there's nothing I can do for them, I will try to connect them to any place that, you know, we can find. And, uh, that's 24 seven because, you know, addiction has never been nine to five. It will never be, but I'm always available to help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. You have a beautiful, you know, not only you do what you do, but you have a beautiful heart. And now punting to Sandra Valls, who has one of the biggest Mexican hearts I know. Um, I love you. And you make me laugh. I don't, I don't let people usually don't make me laugh. And, and when I stumbled upon your show a couple of Saturdays ago and I was jodiendo a ti, that means bothering her in Spanish. Um, <laughs> fucking bo bothering. Bothering, like bothering, like every five minutes, sing this one, sing this one, sing this one. And we um, did though, we, we sang You did, you absolutely did. And um, because, you know, you never give a DJ power to request a song. You never do that. <laughs> so I just want to say you entertain me. You and your sister um, are just really uh, beautiful souls. I always knew you were one. You've grown into a bigger, beautiful soul. I love that you chant Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Mm -hmm. um, do you, and, and I mean, so, I mean, is that all right now that you're promoting is, is the Saturday event? Uh, no, I actually have Women's Week coming up in, uh, in October in Provincetown. I will be there. I also have two Olivia trips. Uh, let's hope it happens because I'm going to Tahiti oh! with Olivia and we're also, that's in September and in November, Olivia is also going to Turks and Caicos. Oh, no. Let's hope that happens <laughs> too. Uh, but everything else has been canceled mm -hmm. that I had planned. Uh, I mean, I, I make my money with crowds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you, you know have, do you have any online shows coming up as well? Yes. Oh, thank you for reminding me. I have an online show that I'm going to post for Olivia, but I also have the uh, an Andrea Meyerson, a Women on a Roll online show, uh, two shows in one day, Cinco de Mayo, because I'm the Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the online show. I find the online shows kind of weird. How do you do stand up for like to the screen? Like, oh, <laughs> tough <girl. laughs> uh, Yeah. Hello. It's this song. Anyway. <laughs> Like, it's like it's like trying to swim in like a, a bathtub how, how does an olympic swimmer want to be like swim in a bucket i don't know where do we find your karaoke on a saturday where how do we find oh, that on facebook sandra vols mm -hmm. v as in right. victor a l l s uh i i posted i'm like i'm going live now on my page uh also my website's we love sandra.com Mm -hmm. That's just in general for you. And we do love Sandra. We do. And Kim and I, Kim and I went to go see, you were one of the comedians that Andrea Meyerson had at the, yeah. at Lesb the, the center. And I have to say, besides the fact that I've known you for years, 
you still are, you, you were one of the funniest people on that stage and, yeah. and, and beyond talented because you are a quadruple threat. You're not just a comedian and mm. you make people smile. You make people laugh. You, you leave the stage and everybody's better because of you. So thank you. Thank you for what you do to our community and to anybody else. So thank you. Thank you guys. For real. Thank you. So Cheryl, what do you yes. have going on online? What do you need uh, to promote? You know, I'm what doing, are you doing? On Online now, you know, every, uh, well, April 22nd, I'm teaching an online course called The Art of Manifesting. So mm. helping everyone kind of get clear on what we want to create, right? What you want to create for the next month and next year. So you can check that out. Definitely. So just check out my website. It's psychicmediumcherylmurphy.com. Do you teach tarot? I brought, I just bought my first tarot deck. I'll teach, teach you. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you how to do it. I'm, I've done it for all. I've done it for 21. I've done it since I was 21. So we'll talk offline. I'll, sh I'll show you. Okay. But it's not about that. I do it a completely different way. And it has nothing to do with the cards. It has to do with mm. spirit speaking through you. And that's the only way to do tarot cards. Mm. So you have to open yourself up. Just saying. Delicia, did I say it right again? You did. I'm so impressed. <laughs> I like Delisha. shout out to you. Big love. Big love, Dan. <laughs> Um, you can find me on whatthehealth.net. I haven't been super active on there, but uh, yeah, that's where I'm at or on Facebook, what the health. And then by the way, when your tree, fruit trees, fruit trees, fruit trees, uh, <laughs> give me a call. I, 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 hey, look, Kim, you want to drive up to her place? She's like uh, yes. in Santa Paula. Kim and I are dying to do a road trip and we'll bring Cara too. You guys Mara, just have to stay six feet away from me and I have to fine. wear a mask. <laughs> We're good. We're good. We got all that. Kim, Kim goes out every single day. Every single every day. Single fucking That's what day. scares me, girl. Yes, me too. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Delisha. I will have to stay at least 10 feet away from yes, you. Please. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have an autoimmune, so I gotta be super careful. Uh-huh. <laughs> so Kim, um, you know, Kim, actually, I, I have to give Kim kudos because out of everybody here, we can do whatever we do from our homes. Mm -hmm. um, Kim is, you know, she's not a healthcare worker. She's not a, you know, a doctor. She's not a this, but, you know, she goes out there every single day and she is um, a champion for me. And I love her. I love her. I worry about her every fucking moment. Um, Dude, you know, what? And I'm too wicked to get sick. I know. And you don't put it, And the thing is, you don't put it out in the universe because that the, the putting shit out in the universe is so powerful and people don't get it. And I love your attitude. I, I love your spirit. You are my sister. I adore you. And I, my life is better with you in it. So thank you so much. And then I have and then I have my baby sister, Mara. Mara, I can't pronounce your real last name because it's just the, the, you have, the S is Sabo. OK, thank you. Right. I'm not silent. <laughs> no, you, I, I, absolutely. And I'm, and I'm happy because you're not. Um, you have so much to say. You are so insightful. You are such an old soul. You have experienced so much. You, you teach me and I'm sure you teach all of us, um, you know, just a little bit better. I mean, I'm sitting here going, maybe I have to go to Al-Anon. Oh shit! I think I am codependent, motherfucker. So I mean, you know, oh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'll call you. So I, what do you have? What what do you have going on, sweetheart? Besides painting that beautiful thing for Delicia, and I can't wait till it's out there and showcased, and you get what you and you get the accolades of your great artistic ability that you deserve. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I do time to time. I do silly videos that I put up on my Facebook page, which is not Mara Zabo. It's Mara Shane. Mm. Um, so you can check out my stuff on Mara Shane. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start painting more jackets. And um, I'm also working right now on a what they call a show Bible. Um, I have this concept for a show that I want to pitch. And I'm excited about that. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. And then there's Cara. Hello there. Uh, <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am actually still working because as a voice artist with my own little studio, I'm still getting the odd job. Not as many and it's yeah. not as interesting. So oh, I guess maybe what am I going to do? Um, I should maybe start up an online course on, you know, bring back McCarthyism. Let's start, <laughs> you know, let's start, let's start <laughs> snitching on our neighbors when they're not wearing a fucking mask. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Cara, can you say fucking mask again? In the, fucking in your mask. Mask, okay. 
Well, I, I mean, I have a problem. My neighbors had like a car birthday party for their mm-hmm. child a couple weekends ago, which cute idea, right? But everybody's handing them a present or whatnot. Plus the problem was it backed up the car so much and I'm sitting out there trying to work in my garden. They're less than 10 feet away from me with the windows rolled down, their kids in their car laughing, giggling. I'm like, I'm trying to protect myself here, people, you know? So it's not really a joke that I wanted to call the cops on my neighbors, but my neighbors are the cops. So what do you do? Exactly. You're fucked. You're fucked no matter. Hey, everybody. Um, Kurt. Thank you for running the boards today. You Thank are you, Kurt. no problem. Hey, hey Kurt, you. can we see you? Can you put your little face up so people can know who the uh, the the, uh, the what is it the uh, the the Doctor Oz or not Doctor Oz? That's the other guy. But you know the Wizard of Oz, the powerful oh, whatever behind the curtain type of thing. I don't have a camera on me, unfortunately. I would have to set that okay. up and. All right. Well, thank you. So, ne- so thank you so much for what you do, and and I appreciate you always taking care of us and be safe and be well. And everyone, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. listening to another show of Between the Sheets podcast. We're here every first and third Friday of every month. Um, so the first Friday in the in May, we will have we all know her as Max Mecca, but her name is Kelly Gilliam, and we have just another fun category: uh, human trafficking. Um, that's what we're going to be covering. <laughs> human trafficking um and uh and then we will have um stephanie shit cara help me what's stephanie's last name why can i fucking remember do not stephanie stephanie dumont oh my god stephanie dumont i think she'll be on and oh, she nice. has a a wonderful show on the active something network i don't know I, I don't prepare you people fucking know i don't prepare um but um we're here every fr- first and third friday um, what I'm doing is I'm doing weekly on Thursdays, uh, Zoom happy hours, the Between the Sheets Zoom happy hours from 6, 6 p.m. Pacific to 7 p.m. Pacific. Um, I will post the Zoom meeting number on my private Facebook page, as well as the Between the Sheets page. We get wonderful women from all around the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if any men comes in and they do stupid stuff, I just block them. And that's the fun part, because I'm cock blocking. Get it? I'm, I'm <laughs> actually cock blocking. Um, Literally. So, I was there ooh. yesterday. I was there in the hot tub, ready and waiting, but I couldn't I find know. the link. It's okay. I will teach you. Um, <laughs> and then, um, and and then, um, oh gosh. And then every night, and I, I, I consider myself crazy for doing this, but I challenged myself every night to sort of not, you know, it's going to sound weird, but it's not like I'm a beacon of hope. But I am consistent, and I know during this time I miss social contact. Mm-hmm. I miss engaging. So what I do every night at 7.30 p.m. Pacific is I go on Facebook and do a Facebook Live for about a half an hour. Sometimes topics, sometimes not. Sometimes it's rambling. Sometimes reveal too much about myself. But um, it's a place that anybody can come to to listen, um, to, you know, spread, you know, spread the joy, spread the pain sometimes. Um, And I get really personal. But, you know, why not? I mean, you, you don't, you don't do fear. You don't, I can't do it in fear. You have to be vulnerable, authentic, honest. And that's what empaths do. So I promised everybody, I will do it every single night. And I have been since the pandemic started and the isolation until it's over. Mm -hmm. Now I hear it's probably going to go to June, 2021. So, um, (laughs) you know, we'll see what, we'll see how that, that happens. But I just want to thank all of you, every single one of you here, every single one of you watching for supporting, for spreading the word. We are here for you. This is Between the Sheets. We talk a lot about Between the Sheets, but this show has always been heart and soul, the heart and soul of every single one of us. So you are part of us. So I appreciate you. I thank you. Um, We will get through this bullshit. And I don't mean it's bullshit meaning bad, but I mean, all this stuff, we will get through because we are a community now. We are an absolute community and I, we need to stick together, check in on your neighbors, wear those goddamn masks, do everything you're supposed to do. <clears throat> you know, be your brother's keeper, you know, check in on your neighbors. Be, you know, like I said, it's awareness, <clears throat> it's love, kindness, compassion, joy, peace, and every other word. This is the time to be within ourselves and take whatever was in us and have that positivity energy just sort of beam out from us to touch those who cannot get there. And um, I love you all. Thank you so much, every, every single person on this page. 
Um, you make me a better person. You, you contribute to the show. I am who I am because of you. The show is a success behind the shoe. And if no one's heard, no one's heard, <laughs> best news ever, <laughs> CBS, who I work for, endorsed my show. Mm. So um, I've got CBS behind us on this show now. So, um, hey, we're doing something good and somebody else thinks so. So I love you all. Be well, be safe, be kind. It's all about love. It really is all about love. So um, I will talk to you soon. Um, I, I miss seeing you. I miss hugging you and touching you guys, not inappropriately. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe some of you guys inappropriately. Why not? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So on that note, thank you, everybody. Please have a great night. Have a great week. We'll see you in two weeks. And as I always sign off, namaste. Namaste, everyone. Nice. Namaste. Namaste. Home. namaste. <laughs> yeah, you're going to stay home. I love you guys. Thank you. Hey, Kurt, where's the music? Where's the music, Kurt? It's playing. Bye, everybody. Thank you.